Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see a lovely full room and to be together. I'm Rabbi Liz P.G. Hirsch. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Temple Anche Amunim. I'm here this evening with Temple President Barbara Vineyard, Lecture Chair Josh Cutler, and our distinguished speaker, Julian Castro. Whether you are a Temple member, a guest, a visitor, a not yet member, we are so pleased you've joined us tonight, either in person here in our sanctuary or virtually from home. This evening marks the 55th anniversary of the founding of the Hilda Vallen Fiegenbaum Memorial Lecture Series. Hilda was deeply loved by her sons, Drs. Armand and Donald Fiegenbaum. At the urging of our Rabbi Emeritus, Harold Salzman, may his memory be for a blessing, they established this lecture in their mother's honor. Hilda believed that tolerance, education, and inclusivity were essential in forming a strong community. She had a vision of a future in which all people would be respected and honored for their own merits and bring healing to our world. These are all values embodied by both our temple community and by our speaker this evening. Over the past five decades, the Fiegenbaum Lecture Series has become a yearly highlight for our congregation. And it's also a time for Temple Anche Amunim to honor and contribute to the robust cultural life of the city of Pittsfield and the broader Berkshires. The brothers, Dr. Fiegenbaum, were innovators whose business took them all over the world, and they were very clear at the same time that Pittsfield was their home. They wanted to enrich the intellectual and cultural life of our congregation and our broader community. Tonight, this lecture, this is their legacy. And so tonight, we honor Donald and Armand, their mother, and their vision for our city. When discussing Mr. Castro's memoir with about 20 members and friends of Temple earlier this month, I asked everyone to find a partner and share a story from their own lives, focusing on their own journey or their family's journey. I asked everyone to tell a story about education or immigration, key themes and elements of Mr. Castro's story too. Many shared passionately and personally about the first person in their family to receive a higher degree, or the first generation of their family to come to America safely. As we read in Vaikra, the book of Leviticus, when strangers reside with you in your land, you shall not wrong them. The strangers who reside with you shall be as your citizens. You shall love each one as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I, the Eternal, am your God. We hope each and every day that we can weave our stories together to live up to this essential value. We declare with the psalmist, Pidchu li sharet tzedek, open the gates of righteousness, open the gates so all may enter. It is our honor and privilege to open our synagogue to host this lecture each year, particularly with such a timely, pertinent, and significant speaker. We're pleased that in 2022, that means both opening both the physical and the virtual gates of our temple, as we are proud each and every year to make this lecture free and open to all. Temple Anche Amunim offers vibrant Shabbat services and events, education and learning opportunities for all ages, wonderful hikes, dinners, high holy day services, and more. If you are looking for a place to find Jewish community, I hope you will join us. Thank you again for being here this evening. I'd now like to introduce our temple president, Barbara Vineyard. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Good evening. And on behalf of the Fiegenbaum Lecture Committee, I'd like to add my welcome to Temple Anshe Amunim. Our temple has served as a beacon of reform Judaism to central Berkshire County and beyond since 1869. The Hilda Vallen Fiegenbaum Memorial Lecture Series was, as you've heard, established 55 years ago by the late doctors Armand and Donald Fiegenbaum as a living tribute to their mother. The brothers wished to bring people of all backgrounds and walks of life into a Jewish house of worship 
to learn from some of the world's most renowned names in government, international affairs, arts, journalism, and Jewish life. And thanks to the incredible generosity of the brothers and of the Fiegenbaum Foundation, the lecture series was endowed in perpetuity in 2013, ensuring that Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum's living legacy will endure for generations to come. In recognition of the occasion of the 55th anniversary of this lecture series, I invite Linda Tyre, mayor of Pittsfield, to come to the BIMA to present a proclamation on behalf of the city, and I'll ask Josh Cutler, the current chair of the lecture series, and Andy Hotchberg, former chair of the series, to accept the proclamation on behalf of the Fiegenbaum Lecture Committee. Good evening. It is such an, a privilege to be here again this evening for another wonderful lecture from a renowned expert in American life and international policy. As your mayor, the mayor of the city of Pittsfield, I'll just say this to Mayor Castro, once a mayor, always a mayor, welcome to the city of Pittsfield, Mayor Castro. On behalf of the city of Pittsfield, I would like to offer this proclamation on the 55th year of the uh, lecture series. Whereas Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum was a distinguished woman with a professional interest in the various facets of Judaism and wished to share her spiritual values with others. And the late doctors Armand V. Fiegenbaum and Donald S. Fiegenbaum endowed the Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum Memorial Lecture Series in 1968 as a living tribute to their beloved mother. 2022 marks the 55th year of the Temple Anshi Amunum that they have hosted the Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum Memorial Lecture Series. This is a tradition that has enriched the community by featuring the nation's most respected politicians, journalists, authors, and scholars. In 2013, the Temple Anchi Amunum Board of Trustees pledged to honor the legacy of the Fiegenbaum family by continuing this lecture series in perpetuity. Now, therefore, I, Linda M. Tyre, mayor of the city of Pittsfield, on behalf of its citizens and city officials, on this 21st day of August 2022, honor the legacy of Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum and pay tribute to her late sons, Dr. Armand V. Fiegenbaum and Dr. Donald S. Fiegenbaum, who have enabled the legacy of their beloved mother to continue in perpetuity. Thank you very much for letting me be part of this evening and for joining you in your faith community. Thank you, Josh. At this time, I would like to remind you to please silence all cell phones and electronic devices. This is our first lecture back in our sanctuary since the beginning of the pandemic. And while we are delighted to welcome you all back to continue this tradition, we're very much aware that COVID is still with us. We ask that you please abide by temple policy and remain masked over your nose and mouth for the entirety of the presentation. Thank you in advance for protecting the health and safety of our friends and neighbors. This year, we are delighted to welcome Mayor, Mr. Secretary Julian Castro to Temple Anshe Amuni, a former Democratic candidate for president in 2020. Mr. Castro served as the 16th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Barack Obama 
from 2014 to 2017, and as mayor of San Antonio from 2009 to 2014. In 2012, Mr. Castro became the first Latino to deliver the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention. Today, Mr. Castro serves on the board of directors of the LBJ Foundation and as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. As our rabbi mentioned, Mr. Castro's book, An Unlikely Journey, Waking Up from the American Dream, was recently the subject of a lively discussion here at Temple Anshe Amunim. It's the story of his personal journey from poverty to Stanford and Harvard and national recognition with lessons for all of us about immigration in America. And I have to say I was particularly moved by Mr. Castro's tribute to the two women who made that journey possible, his grandmother and his mother. Following Mr. Castro's remarks, Josh Cutler, who has chaired this lecture series for five years, will moderate a question and answer session. Many of you already received uh, cards and pencils. If you'd like to ask a question, please see any of our ushers. Following the lecture, we'll have a dessert reception on the front portico outside of the building, and you'll have an opportunity to meet Mr. Castro. Now, to discuss the American dream and the future of our nation, and to celebrate the lives of Hilda Valen Fiegenbaum and Drs. Armand and Donald Fiegenbaum, please join me in a warm welcome to Julian Castro. Good evening. Is this on? All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Barbara, so much for that introduction, and thank you to Mayor Tyre. Uh, thank you to Rabbi Hirsch for welcoming me uh, here to the temple, and to everybody uh, here who was part of the uh, temple community. It is a real pleasure to be with you here tonight. Uh, this is the first time that I've ever visited Western Massachusetts, and uh, I'll have you know that I got here a little bit earlier and went looking for some good Mexican food. <laughs> I didn't find it, but that's because ponchos and Tito's were closed today. <laughs> uh, it's my first time in this area, but it's not my first time to talk about what we're going to discuss today. You know, they say that in polite company that you shouldn't discuss uh, politics or faith. We're in a wonderful house of worship about to talk democracy and politics. So I hope the Lord will be kind to us. When we do that, when we talk these days, especially in such a polarized America, about how we see the world and how we see our politics, I think it helps to establish the lens with which we're looking, through which we're looking, where we come from, what our experiences are, what we bring to the table in terms of our perspective. And for me, as Robert mentioned, uh, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Hopefully some of you all had visited the Riverwalk and the Alamo and gotten some good Tex-Mex food and margaritas perhaps on the Riverwalk. I grew up with my twin brother, Joaquin, who serves as the congressman today for the 20th Congressional District. If you ever see us uh, on MSNBC, he's the one with the beard. So that's the easy way to tell us apart. He also likes to say that I'm a minute uglier than he is, but don't believe that part. We grew up with my mother and my grandmother, and my grandmother, in fact, almost 100 years exactly ago, on August 9th, just a couple of weeks ago, it marked 100 years since my grandmother crossed the border from Mexico into the United States. She was brought by her closest relatives because her parents had passed away when she was six or seven years old and they were bringing her here with, along with her younger sister to live with them and to have a future. My grandmother uh, immigrated to the west side of San Antonio and got pulled out of school to help her family when she was in third or fourth grade and so she worked as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter because she never really got a formal education. Uh, she ended up raising my mom as a single parent on the west side of San Antonio and my mom 
raised my brother Joaquin and I as a single parent after our parents split up when we were eight. My mom was also a hellraiser when she was young. She was a Chicana activist, part of the Mexican-American civil rights movement uh, that y'all may remember from the late 1960s and early 1970s. She started out in the Young Democrats when she was uh, in her early 20s and then was part of a push for uh, access for Hispanics and for women. She ran for city council in San Antonio when she was 23 years old. At that time, very few people of color and very few women were able to win because there were no single member districts in a city of about 500,000 people. And so she didn't win, but she kept on pushing and pushing like a lot of folks. Uh, and she raised my brother and me to believe in ourselves and to believe that we could go further than my grandmother had been able to and we had been, and she had been able to. In fact, I remember uh, showing up at middle school orientation when my brother and I were about to enter the sixth grade, and y'all remember orientation in high school or middle school, usually you know, it's in an auditorium. And we went to the orientation, and uh, at some point in the orientation, when all the kids were there with their parents, uh, one of the teachers or administrators said something to the effect, that you almost like you, the, the kind of uh, phrasing that you almost only hear in movies, that he asked us to look around the room. Uh, and he said that the chances were that up to half of us might not be there when it came time to graduate the eighth grade and move on to high school. And, you know, that didn't mean much to my brother and me at that time. We were 11 or 12 and probably not even paying attention. But to my mom, that was a huge red flag. And she yanked us out of that school later that day. And she didn't tell us why until later. She said that she would never leave her sons anywhere where they didn't even believe that we could make it out of the eighth grade. We made it out of the eighth grade and we made it out of high school and then were able to go on to college at Stanford and go on to law school down the road at Harvard uh, and then become the first in our family to be professionals as attorneys. I got elected to the city council in San Antonio when I was 26 and then eventually got elected mayor. My brother got elected state representative and served for 10 years in the Texas House, if you can believe that. He's still alive. Uh, and then got elected to Congress and will hit 10 years in January of 2023. He's still alive still, <laughs> which is, I don't know which is more of an accomplishment, getting through the folks in Texas or getting through some of these folks in DC. Uh, but you know, I remember the day that my brother and I got our acceptance letter to college. It was Friday, April 3rd, 1992. And I don't know about y'all, but when I applied to college, I think it's different these days. You know, I have a 13-year-old and a 7-year-old, and I'm sure that they're going to find out over email or something or log into some sort of account, right, special password that they have to put in. But we used to wait for the mail to find out, right, that you got into college or didn't get in. Right, anything big, really. My grandmother's social security check so that we could go buy goodies, you know, on the first day of the month. And that Friday, April 3rd of 1992, uh, my brother and I ran out to the mailbox because we had been like, checking the mailbox every day. And we got these two packets. Y'all may remember that when you applied to college, you wanted to get a packet and not a letter, because if it was just a letter, it was probably like, thanks, but no thanks. You know, have a, have a good future, but you're not admitted. So we got these two packets, and they were those large packets that are in that weird green and white, you know that green and white triangular border? I don't even know what you call that. We went in, we ripped open those packets, and the letter at the top of it said, congratulations and welcome to the Stanford class of 1996. And that was one of those moments in life where you suddenly feel this rush of joy and triumph and the sense that everything is great in the world and you see the future and that things are going to be good. I remember that for myself, but what I remember just as much or maybe even more now is the look on my grandmother's face. I wish back in 1992 that we'd had cell phone cameras the way that everybody has them today. Most of the time, they're like the bane of people's existence, everybody taking a photo. And but 
I wish I could have captured the look on her face at how proud she was because she never thought that that kind of thing would have been possible for her or for my mom, but it's also was something that she had worked toward very hard and very humbly. Uh, and I think a lot these days, especially because we just marked 100 years since my grandmother and my family got to the United States, about how many other families have taken the same journey in our country from so many different places all over the world, whether it was like my family from Mexico or people from Europe or from Russia or any number of other places and under different circumstances, of course, too. But so many with the same dreams and the same hopes for themselves and also for our country. What they would be able to do in the United States of America, a land that they knew as a place of opportunity and of freedom and of so much promise and possibility that in a very real way was salvation to them. I think about that these days because the times that we've lived through, and I think it's appropriate this being the first time back in person for this lecture since this pandemic began, have undoubtedly been like unlike anything else that any of us has ever lived through before. A moment that has been unique not only in the United States and each of our daily lives, but also in the life of our world. It is no understatement to say that. And here at home, in our country, the pandemic that has taken a million American lives, the recession that came with it and caused so much loss in its own right and shuffling and pain and uncertainty. In the spring of 2020, the murder of George Floyd and the renewed push for racial justice and equality in our country the rise of an anti-democratic spirit and movement in the United States, exemplified by January 6th, and an assault on voting rights in state legislatures across the country. The overturning of Roe versus Wade, going back on half a century of precedent that protected the constitutional right to choose. These times feel uncertain and polarized and for many people frightening. We live in an age where our world is constantly changing and sometimes it's hard to tell whether we're moving forward or backward. One of the most moving moments in my time in public service was in March of 2015. During my time as HUD secretary for President Obama, I had the honor of being in the audience when the president went down to Selma to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Up on the stage along with Mrs. Obama and with then Representative John Lewis, who 50 years earlier had been part as a young man of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and suffered the consequences for that in his bravery and courage. And others who came to bear witness to the moment. I told the president that I thought that was perhaps his best speech because that day in Selma, he spoke to something that I think is very true about our country that the experience that we have shared, no matter where we come from or who we are, the color of our skin, our background, has been one of hope and possibility, but also setback and pain. And that as a country, there was no denying that we've made tremendous progress since Selma. 
we weren't living in the same moment they were living in 50 years before. So much more was possible. Progress toward equality was undeniable. And he was a testament to that, a living embodiment of some of that progress. But he also said something else that's very true, that there was a lot more progress to make. This moment that we're in right now, I think the question is, are we going to go forward? Or are we going to go backward? Are we going to continue to progress as a people, as a country, or are we going to regress? I hope that if we've taken anything from the last two years, it's two things. First, that as a country that we can still do big things. Remember how uncertain and scary it was in those first few weeks of the pandemic. We didn't know the severity of COVID-19 and we watched those images of people, of, of bodies stacked up in New York City, of headlines that read of deaths in nursing homes, of tragedies happening across the, the country because of the virus. And to think how quickly, not without some missteps, but how quickly our investment in science, in knowledge, was able to provide safety through vaccination and also the buy-in of individuals all across this country to come together and do their part, whether it was something as simple as wearing a mask or keeping six feet apart or being considerate of others in other ways, any number of things. The knock on America today is often that we can't do grand big things. And although the response was far from perfect, I think it was a response that showed that when we care and when we're unified, as, as unified as we can get in this time, that we can do big and important things. The second thing that I hope we take from it is that we're all in this together. I think that no matter who you are in this country, you had some of the common experience of COVID, of this pandemic and everything that came with it. Maybe some folks weren't as affected as others, of course, economically or health-wise. But everybody was affected somehow. In other words, everybody had some kind of common experience that we could draw on. And my hope is also that we realize that what affects the farm worker in a field in California or a meat packing plant worker in the Midwest or a nurse on an overnight shift in New York City affects all of us in intimate ways and in ways that we don't expect. And the question becomes going forward, what are we going to do about that? Do we have the political will to take those lessons and to make something of it? Are we in a place right now when we're, where we're able to do that? When I was mayor of San Antonio in 2010, I visited Israel with the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. It was my first time visiting the country. I found it a beautiful country and a wonderful people. Like many places in the United States, San Antonio uh, often encounters drought. And so we visited the city of Elat to study their water system and to better understand how they deal with water shortages. We struck up a friendship city agreement with Tel Aviv. And I marveled at the Art Deco architecture that reminded me of Miami a lot. And of course, we visited Jerusalem and took in all of the history 
and how special that community is. We visited Yad Vashem. And before I left, I had an opportunity to sit down with Shimon Peres, who at that time in 2010 was president of Israel, of course. Someone that it goes without saying, possessed a lot of wisdom and knowledge from his experience. And we had a wonderful conversation, but the thing that I remember most from the conversation was that at one point he said, you know, when we want to know, when we want to judge our appearance and work to improve it, we look in a mirror. What is the mirror that we can look into to improve and take care of us, our souls, our internal beings? What is that? That question, that lesson stuck with me. I think there are many things. I think our faith is certainly one of those things, the values, the principles that we hold dear. Other people in our lives who help show us the way, help guide us, who we use as a sounding board about our own well-being, spiritually and otherwise. But these days I think about that for us as a nation. Because I believe that one of the ways we gauge how we're doing internally is the health of our democracy. We all have different beliefs, different faiths, come from different places, but as Americans, we're supposed to be united in a common belief that everybody counts, that everybody has a voice through the ballot box, that we achieve progress and freedom and opportunity and all that we hold dear through the expression of everybody's preference by voting, by participating, by being a part of our democracy. It's uncomfortable and unsettling because these days that's exactly what we see under assault in too many places in our nation. And in the years to come, we desperately need to develop a common sense of identity and re-energize a sense of purpose to make our democracy stronger and to make our nation stronger. So when we ask, what are we going to do about it? The thing is that there are things that we can do about it. There are reforms that we can make to make our democracy healthier. We can do redistricting reform so that we don't encourage people only to speak to folks that believe like they do, but encourage more of our elected officials to have to speak across the aisle, across ideological differences to people that they may not be used to speaking to. Today in the United States, more than 15 states already have some form of neutral or bipartisan or nonpartisan commission style redistricting. We can get rid of big dark money in politics. For those who wonder why in the world we just barely passed a law, for instance, that would allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices, even with all of the loopholes that it has still, when the vast majority of Americans want for our government to be able to do that and to lower their prescription drug prices? Or why almost 90% of Americans support universal background checks, but enough of our elected officials are not willing to sign off on that. There is a profound and very damaging disconnect between too many folks who serve in public office 
and the well-being of the people that they represent. And that part of that is the corrosive influence of big money. We can reform or get rid of our filibuster. We have a lot of checks and balances already built into our system. And the filibuster is nowhere in the United States Constitution. Too many times we've seen sensible legislation like background checks or common sense compromise immigration reform, stymied by a filibuster that is relatively new given the scope of the history of our country, but at the same time has been, has been too destructive of good ideas and good policy. We can reform our Supreme Court. However you feel about the decisions that were made, why is it that one president who served four years gets to appoint three Supreme Court justices and another who may serve eight years gets one or two and that there's no certainty so that there's this game that is played of only young people, people in their early 40s being appointed to the federal bench so that they're going to stay there for 40 years. There are different ways that you can do this. Some folks have suggested adding justices. Others have looked at ending lifetime appointments and making those a certain number of years. There are different ways to approach it, but I believe that we need to make that process more sensible. There are also, I believe, changes that we need to make to life as we live it today. tamping down on disinformation in social media. Because too often times, people's beliefs are shaped or ill-shaped by information that simply is false, but that they take into the ballot box and act on in a very true way. We can find ways in simple things but powerful ways, like how we build out our communities. Think about the bedrock of communities, of public libraries, of public parks, of transit, of how we encourage people to actually get to know one another, to live with one another, to be next to each other. 25 years ago when I started law school, one of the things that amazed me was the public transportation system in Boston, riding the T, and people from different walks of life that you would encounter there. And look, I have to admit, um, not everybody was talking to each other. Oftentimes people were reading their newspaper or I'm sure these days on their phone. But that transit system, those public parks, those libraries, the arts, there are, there are ways that we find that we do get exposed to people that we otherwise might not get to learn about. We learn new things and new ideas. That is important, it's powerful, and it is vital to the health of our democracy in this 21st century. Civics education. I'm convinced that so much of what we see happening with the erosion in our democracy is due to the fact that so many folks don't quite appreciate the history of our country and of our democracy and how fragile democracies around the world really are. And people from both parties have proposed strengthening an investment in civics education so that people of all different backgrounds in public schools and private schools better understand how to be good keepers of that flame and to pass it on. 
And so from what we see around us in our infrastructure to what we see online, to what happens in the halls of Washington and in state legislatures across this country, there are things that we can be doing now to make our democracy healthier. It is not a time to throw up our hands or to feel helpless or to feel like it's never going to change. It's a time to push in a very focused and practical way for those improvements so that we can reap the benefit of them in the years to come. Of course, doing that ultimately is not only in all of our hands, it's also in the hands of our elected officials. In order to do so many of these things, we need people who actually care people who are committed to expanding our democracy, not shrinking it. People, I hope, who are committed to ensuring that the least among us are able to prosper and to advance in our society. And that brings me to the second part of my remarks tonight, which is about what we face in November. Now, how many of y'all remember election night 2016? <laughs> I know you probably don't want to remember it, a lot of y'all. But I remember that I was totally caught off guard. I did not expect Donald Trump to win the 2016 election. And I say that at the outset to say anything is possible, right? We don't know what's going to happen. So let me say this, and I'm sure you all have heard this before. In the last hundred years, there have been only two elections, in 1934 under FDR and in 2002 under George W. Bush, when the incumbent president's party didn't lose seats in the midterm. On average, that party this year, the Democratic Party, that party loses 26 House seats and four Senate seats. If Democrats were to lose 26 House seats and four Senate seats, we're looking at a Republican Congress controlling everything that we just talked about, plus the ability of President Biden to make any appointments to the federal judiciary or other executive positions. We're looking at the end of all of the investigation into January 6th and new investigations into Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice, into why Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago mansion was uh, searched, into any number of things. You remember Fast and Furious and Benghazi and Hillary Clinton testifying for 11 straight hours of very well, I thought, a few years ago. But that's what that would mean. And so far, up until the last few weeks, to read a lot of the press around this, you would think that that's the cycle, that's the kind of cycle that we're headed toward. The president's approval rating had been in the high 30s, low 40s, in the generic ballot that measures generic preference for who should control Congress, Democrats and Republicans had been about even, perhaps with Democrats leading by about two points, but for whatever reason, Democrats need to lead a lot more than that generally to actually come out gaining seats. And generally, the president's approval rating has to be higher than that, at least into the mid-40s or higher, to be in good shape. There are at least three things that Democrats have going for them that might help buck that trend. The first is, in my estimation, GOP overreach and extremism. We see that extremism in states like mine in Texas, where a trigger law on abortion will criminalize doctors who perform abortions 
In other states where they've gone even further and they have a total ban on abortion that does not exempt incest or rape. We've seen that on the issue of guns. In late May, only about an hour away from my hometown of San Antonio, in the small community, about 18,000 people of Uvalde, Texas, I don't have to tell anybody what happened there, 19 children and two teachers gunned down by an 18-year-old who was able to purchase these weapons right after he turned 18 and go into that school and murder those children operating fully within the gun laws that we have in the state of Texas and the United States. And as that has become more and more a focal point of Texans and Americans after Newtown, after El Paso, after Pittsburgh, after any number of other places that are becoming too many to count and name, the Republican Party is more and more seen as extreme and out of touch on this issue. Now that's one thing, along with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a mixed blessing for Republicans. When he's on the ballot, he can actually bring a lot of Republicans out that don't normally vote. We saw that in Texas. For those of y'all that read all of the stories or watched them after the 2020 election and how some counties in South Texas that are heavily Hispanic actually voted in greater numbers for Donald Trump than they had four years earlier. And the reason, the primary reason for that was not mostly that people had shifted, although that did happen to some extent, it's that they got a lot of people that don't normally vote that are casual, sometimes inconsistent, basically Republicans, to show up and actually go vote and did a better job of that than Democrats did in South Texas. And so he has this ability like a magnet to pull people out when he's on the ballot that don't normally come out. At the same time, for a large swath of people, and this is one of the reasons I believe Joe Biden won, he turns people off completely. And every single day that Republicans are having to defend Donald Trump and what happened at Mar-a-Lago and documents that he might have and how dangerous that might be to the national security of the United States and our allies, that's a day that Republicans lose. Every day that they're not accusing Democrats of making inflation worse and being out of touch and being too quote unquote woke for, you know, middle America, that's a, that's a good day for Democrats. The second thing is more substantive. President Biden and Democrats have gotten an impressive string of legislation done over these last couple of months from the Inflation Reduction Act to investments in advanced manufacturing, uh, to any number of investments that are going to make a difference in people's lives. On top of that, gas prices have fallen for several weeks now. Finally, the average went under $4. Inflation at least stabilized last month, although people are still hurting and still feeling that. And so the news, by the way that most Americans feel it, is better, going in the right direction at least, and we still have two months before the November 8th election. And then finally, the thing that Democrats have going for them are bad GOP candidates. Candidates that are fully ensconced in the MAGA movement. Candidates like Blake Masters in Arizona or Herschel Walker in Georgia, or Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, or Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. Folks who seem out of touch and loyal to a figurehead leader instead of people who are earnestly seeking an election to serve their constituents. And candidacies do matter. Y'all may remember a few years ago, candidates like Christine O'Donnell. Right? Remember that from New Hampshire? I'm not a witch. 
candidates in Nevada and Missouri whose verbal gaffes and extreme positions turned off people that might otherwise have been gettable by Republicans. That's the very thing that's happening now with Senate candidates. And so when you look at the latest averages of polling, surprisingly, Democrats are holding up pretty well. And just two days ago, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that he wouldn't be surprised if Democrats kept majority of the United States Senate. And that prompted Tucker Carlson on Fox News to go on a tirade against Mitch McConnell and blame it all on him. I say all of that to say we don't know what's going to happen. Yes, the weight of history and precedent is on Republicans winning in November, but if you think about those years where that trend was bucked, 1934 and 2002, 1934 at the height of the Great Depression under FDR, and 2002, a year after 9-11, very unique moments in American history. I think it's very fair to say that the moment that we've just lived through and we're living through now is a unique moment in American history. And that's why I believe, or maybe it's fair to say, I hope that history will not repeat itself this November. And that includes in my home state of Texas. I know that every cycle y'all hear that this may be the cycle where Texas goes blue. A lot of people roll their eyes at that. And I understand why. But let me just tell you very quickly about what has already happened in Texas. In 2012, President Obama lost his reelection bid to Mitt Romney by 16 points in Texas. In 2016, Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump by nine points in Texas. And in 2020, President Biden lost by five and a half points in Texas. So despite everything that you've heard about some counties in South Texas going in one direction or maybe being more pro-Trump, during that Trump era, Democrats in the state won, they gained Two congressional seats, Lizzie Fletcher and Colin Allred in suburbs of Houston and Dallas. Two state Senate seats and 12 state House seats in 2018. Beto O'Rourke in 2018 came within two and a half points, maybe just under three points, of Ted Cruz, which was the best showing for a Democrat statewide in years. And basically everybody held serve in 2020. It was a wash. There was hardly maybe one seat that changed, nothing, either way. So when you look at the trajectory of Texas, Texas has actually made impressive progress and been one of the states that pushed away from Republicans during the Trump era. This year, there's an especial opportunity because the governor there, Abbott, is seen as having made several terrible missteps with a winter freeze in 2021 that killed several hundred Texans. The shooting in Uvalde and all of the mess around that and what actually happened and the response to it, as well as draconian laws on abortion and on guns and a general sense that this governor has been incompetent. You know, it's one thing for people to disagree with you on ideology. It's another thing, no matter what your job is, for people to feel like you're just bad at your job. They start judging you in an altogether different way. And I think for him, that's where he's fallen with voters who could go either way. And so in Texas, the latest polling has Beto O'Rourke about five points down from Governor Greg Abbott. And down ballot candidates like Rochelle Garza, who's from the Rio Grande Valley, Brownsville, and running for attorney general against Ken Paxton, who has been indicted now for several years, running only two points down, 34-32 in the latest poll. I say all of that to say that 
this may be one of the most interesting years that we've seen in politics in a very long time where a lot of the old rules don't necessarily apply. The pundits have said that at some point, you know, the usual laws of politics are going to apply to this cycle. And maybe that's true. We still have about 10 weeks. But maybe it's not. And we're going to be, I'm going to be as surprised in a positive direction as I was flabbergasted and surprised in a negative direction six years ago in 2022. No matter what happens, though, in November, for all of us who care about our democracy and ensuring that beyond 2022, beyond 2024, that we still have this most prized possession of our United States of America, it makes sense to take the steps to ensure that it's healthy. That starts, of course, with all of us being full citizens, engaging, voting, encouraging others to vote, volunteering, whichever candidates we want to support. It matters that people are in the mix, making our democracy stronger. Right after college and before law school, I went back to my old high school and I was a permanent substitute teacher for a semester. For those of y'all that are teachers, you know that a permanent substitute teacher has neither the advantage of being an actual teacher with real ability to teach, uh, nor the advantage of just a substitute teacher with the ability to get out of the class before they can take advantage of you. I had turned 22 when I looked like I belonged in a classroom, and they said that a teacher had had a nervous breakdown and asked if I would volunteer to teach three classes for a semester. This was at my old high school, and one class had 38, 39 people, one class had 38, and one class had 37, which I thought was illegal in Texas, but apparently not. On the third or fourth day when I was there, I turned around to write something on the blackboard. We still used you know, the blackboard with chalk at that point. And somebody took a paper ball from the back of the room, like three or four loose leaf sheets and rolled them up and threw it and it hit the back of my head. And I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know whether to pretend like it didn't happen and save my dignity or turn around and try and figure out who had done it. I think I tried to figure out, but never found out. I went home every afternoon, and I felt like I had to take a five-hour nap. <laughs> One of the teachers probably can relate to that. But it did two things. First, it gave me an immense respect for teaching. My father was a teacher in public schools for 31 years. And that it's really a craft in imparting knowledge effectively and controlling a classroom and how you do that when you have a couple of students that are determined not to let you go forward. But also, it taught me forever the importance of being prepared. Because it made me realize that I wasn't prepared for that. We have to be prepared. To protect and strengthen our democracy. To be active citizens to ensure its health so that we are able to hand it down. That is, in a very real way, what is on the ballot in 2022, in 2024, and beyond. And a few years ago, that may have seemed melodramatic, but for anybody who's paying attention, I guarantee you that it is not. It is real. When you have people who are blindly following an individual who wants to win at any cost and absolutely determined to say they won regardless of what the votes actually say. And not just in DC, but in little courthouses and elections clerk offices all over the United States. That 
is something to get up and stand up and participate and make sure that we go in a better direction, that we use these tools that all who have come before us have given us. And in doing that, I think that in part we answer President Beres's question of what is that mirror? That mirror is the action that we take, the democracy that we create, that we leave for generations to come. Thank you all very much for having me. Well, Mr. Castro, I want to thank you for your poignant remarks and certainly uh, with everything that's going on in the country, they're very timely as well. Uh, as you can imagine, we have a, a many questions from the audience and a reminder that if anybody has any questions, please write them down on a, uh, on a card and one of our ushers will come by and pick them up from you uh, and they will relay them to me. Um, before we get into some policy questions, um, a number of people in the uh, congregation have read your book. Uh, we recently had a, a, a book session and uh, one of the uh, questions that came through was what are the pluses and minuses of being a twin? <laughs> Mostly pluses, I assure you. Um, it's a great question, and I'll answer it seriously, actually. Um, I used to say that being a twin was 99% uh, blessing and 1% curse. Uh, the 99% blessing was that, uh, and how many folks are twins? Is there anybody who's, who has twins? Parents of twins? Grandparents of twins? There you go. <laughs> um, the, the neat part of it was that uh, it's someone in your life that you're literally you're walking through the world with who looks like you and people treat like you and often see you as a package deal. Uh, and so it's inevitable that you become closer to your twin brother or sister than anybody else. And, um, you know, when my brother Joaquin and I went off to college, uh, when we left to Stanford, we cried on the first leg of the flight on Southwest Airlines from San Antonio all the way to El Paso. It was only the second time we'd ever been on a plane, had never been to Stanford before, uh, and it was this, the flight attendant had to bring us those, those tough Southwest napkins to wipe away our tears. But we were also lucky, or I was lucky, because I had my brother there. And I think even more so that we were twins, um, because you sort of fill in the, the gaps for each other. Uh, and, but the curse was, at least for me, that I never felt compelled to go and make a whole bunch of other friends, you know, because I had this perfect friend, almost. Uh, and I think if I had not had a twin brother, that probably would have been different. I probably would have been more extroverted, probably would have been seeking friends out more, at least in my mind, that's what I imagine. Um, all in all, though, it's, it's wonderful. This next question comes more from your experience with your uh, time with housing and urban development. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on addressing affordable housing given the current inflation and housing and rental prices? It's, uh, I mean, first, we had a rental affordability crisis in our country before the pandemic. Uh, we saw rental price, uh, costs rising throughout this country in cities big and small before 2020. And that's only exacerbated since then. And so, you know, when I ran for president, I proposed some of this, and I know Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, Senator Booker, and at that time, Senator Harris proposed a much more robust housing investment that we would make in different ways, from low-income housing tax credits to, uh, Strengthening our FDA, uh, I mean FDA, now I'm forgetting my acronyms. What's that? No, I'll remember in a second. Um, I know. <laughs> um, to investing in public housing, I think, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes in our country's history on public housing. There's no question about that. But if you could do public housing right, if you actually committed to it, I actually see that as a good buffer, a good hedge against the volatility of the rental market. 
the trick is you have to be willing to invest in it and maintain it and do it right. When I was HUD secretary, we were $26 billion in the hole in terms of maintenance needs on public housing. And we had about 1.2 million units of public housing and we were losing 10,000 units every year to disrepair. Uh, so, you know, we're not where we need to be on public housing. Um, but in every way that we can spur investment and new supply, and then on the other side, we need to do better about allowing for the creation of units, including affordable units in a lot of places where they're not, um, where they're not built now. I'll just say, you know, I spent years on the San Antonio City Council and as mayor watching zoning appeals and, you know, hearings and so forth. Um, and then as HUD secretary, I traveled to 100 different communities and got a sense of what was happening there, plans that were in the works, some of them were, were successful, a lot of them get stymied for affordable housing. A lot of times I couldn't tell whether somebody was a Republican or a Democrat or called themselves liberal or conservative when they came up and railed about the, pro the project, the housing project that was gonna come up in their neighborhood. All of a sudden, everybody gets very, very protective. Of, oh, just not near me. That's truth, that's just being honest. And I understand it, like everybody is concerned about what's in their neighborhood. Everybody should be. I mean, folks have earned what they have, right? You, of course you wanna know what's gonna be in your neighborhood and wanna make sure that people are gonna be safe and it's gonna be you know, good neighbors. But the level of, of stereotyping and uh, you know, generalizing and fear mongering that I often saw was such a disappointment to people in the community that I even knew on so many other things, you know, I'd be in agreement with, you know, on politics, on partisanship and stuff. And we have to get better as a country. Uh, and this is, this is aimed just generally, all of us, we have to get better at accepting um, people who don't have much. People who, of whatever background they are, not of means. Uh, until we do that, I have a feeling that we're never really going to get past our housing affordability challenge because there are too many roadblocks to the construction of it. And as you mentioned, marginalized populations with housing, I want to move on to voting rights. In your book, you talk about the Voting Rights Act passed by Lyndon Baines Johnson. Given the current political climate to change the voting rights of marginalized populations, what can be done? Well, I mean, I think that... Uh, the opportunity that we had uh, last year to pass voting rights was a tremendous opportunity that I was, like I'm sure many folks here, very sad to see uh, not realized. Uh, but we have the Electoral Count Act. We have other ways that we can at least protect from the worst outcomes and you know, fake electors and other things that could possibly happen in late 2024, or early 2025, if we're not careful. Uh, but I think that in states like mine, in Texas, where Republicans have made it very, very difficult to register to vote, we have no real online voting registration, and you have to be deputized by the elections clerk if you want to go register people in that county. So you have to go to every single county elections clerk and get permission, basically, and go through a training in that county if you want to go the next county over and try and help people fill out a form. And also there are restrictions on that you can't have the forms in your position for a, more than a certain number of hours. It's criminalized if you do. So a lot of people, it just chills the whole process. People don't want to mess with that. A lot of folks are afraid to handle it. Hey, I'm not gonna go to jail for trying to help out. You know, I understand that too, the fear. Um, so, but what I hope will happen is that when, when the state turns over uh, that I hope the Democrats will be as intentional and precise about actually boosting access to the ballot box as the other side has been at limiting it. You know, universal online voter registration. Um, what uh, Alex Badia, when he was Secretary of State, did in California with pre-registration for people who are 16 or 17 years old in high school to get them into the pipeline. 
Uh, there are a number of other things that we can do to make it easier to vote instead of harder to vote. And I think that we can take a cue from places like Oregon and California that have done that. So the question that has been asked the most, both prior to this and tonight, immigration, immigration, immigration. This crowd would like to know, what is your view about what to do at the border? Well, I mean, I think we have to do two things. You know, of course, you have to make sure that you have an orderly border, right? Every country in the world is concerned about that. And uh, as I see it, you need to make sure that you have an orderly uh, enforcement of your laws and do it in a humane way. And what I saw in the Trump administration was that it was a completely inhumane and cruel way to treat people. Some of y'all may have read that story in The Atlantic from just a couple of weeks ago by Caitlin Dickerson about the entire history and background of family separation. You know, Trump rose to power from the very first day that he announced on basically a, a fear of demographic change uh, and a xenophobia. I think an unnecessary xenophobia toward people who are seeking a better life. Should, people should come here to the United States legally, right? We know that. Yeah, people should come. But it's also true that for years and years and years, because of the economic pressures, because of other dangers that people face, that people have tried to come here and tried any means they can to protect themselves and their family. When I was growing up there in Texas, George Bush, when he was governor, I guess I was in college by that time, but he used to say all the time, family, van family values don't stop at the Rio Grande. And that was a Republican saying that. Meaning, of course, people are going to try and do what they can for their family. All right? if, if they don't have means in their country, they're desperate. Folks here in the crowd know that, too. People fleeing persecution. Um, your families that have a history, uh, many families around the world. And so I believe that we need to have an orderly approach that includes restarting our asylum system, increasing the number of refugees at least to the cap because we're far underneath our cap. I think the cap right now is maybe 125,000 or in that range. And it's nowhere near that. It's not even half of that right now that we're taking in. Maybe uh, because of Afghanistan or one or two other places it's risen in the last year. But we also, um, I believe, need to improve our legal immigration system. Part of the reason that people don't try and quote unquote, for those that don't, because remember, a lot of these people at the southern border, they're requesting asylum. That's legal. You know, that's not illegal. They're not illegal quote unquote immigrants. They are requesting asylum, which is recognized in just about every country as legal but they're being treated basically as though they're illegal, right? Um, people have to wait years and years and years under the legal asylum, the legal immigration process. I think that we need to focus on improving that process so that we can get people through that pipeline much better. And people have confidence in that system. But why would they have confidence in it now when it can take 10 years, 15 years, whatever it takes? And then finally, uh, when it comes to these Northern Triangle countries, Central America and so forth, uh, I think that we need to take a long-term approach. And this is the work that Vice President Harris is engaged in. We need to make sure that we work with those Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador and Guatemala and so forth, Honduras, so that people can find safety and opportunity there in their home country. Because like anybody, they would prefer, I'm sure, if they can live and be okay and prosper in their home country. So if we engage in the kind of partnership with these countries to try and help better improve safety and uh, opportunity, then I think what you see is an easing of that flow of people over time. And that's a good long-term way to address this issue. Um, the last thing I'll say about it is just that, you know, I, what I don't believe in is I don't believe that scapegoating people who, scapegoating people as just criminals or just here to take people's jobs and so forth, I don't think that reflects reality and uh, I don't think that it's good for our country. 
Another policy question. You mentioned in your uh, remarks about civics education, but what are your thoughts about universal public services, like for example, public health or education? Uh, I think we should invest in a more robust program for that. You know, of course, we've had different models of that. The Peace Corps was one model in the 60s, and then um, Clinton revamped a model uh, in the 1990s that was more domestically focused. Uh, I've never been one to say that we should require it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't feel like we should require that, but I do think that we should make it as attractive as possible to folks. Um, because it gives them opportunity. Oftentimes, what I saw in my community that I grew up in is that whether it's some sort of public service like that or the military could often be stabilizing for people, you know, for young people that otherwise were going in a bad direction. Now, that doesn't always happen, but it, it can serve at a very critical age as as a more positive outlet for uh, their, their effort and their talent, their work, than going down a more negative path. So we can make it as ro robust as possible, but you know, I don't necessarily think that uh, we should make it mandatory. Thank you. And so now we'll move on to some discussion about the November election, and as we look forward towards 2024, uh, we'll conclude with a few questions about about these. Can you comment on the significance of Liz Cheney's election results and if you see them as significant? Yeah, I think they're significant because there's no place for non-believers in Donald Trump in the Republican Party these days. It's like a cult, is how I see it. And there were, as y'all saw the breakdown probably, there were I think 10 people that voted for his impeachment. A couple of them retired, Tony Gonzalez in Ohio and one or two others. I think only two people who stood for election actually won their primaries. David Valadeo in California, and then I, some, I'm sure somebody here remembers the second one, but only two out of 10. The other ones, Liz Cheney and a number of other people, Jamie Herrera Butler, that was one of the few Hispanic women, in, Republicans in Congress lost in Washington. Uh, so, it's extreme. Uh, I think it's gone off the rails in a number of different ways. And, you know, I applaud Liz Cheney for having the courage to stand on her principle and to oppose Donald Trump. I mean, I disagree with her on a lot of policy. And, you know, if the choice were her and a Democrat in an election, I would vote for the Democrat just about every time, <laughs> probably. But, I do recognize that there are, there are too few people in politics that are willing to lose their election based on principle, a good principle. You need more people like that in both parties instead of people who just want to go along to get along and win their election and that's that because that also bites Democrats, you know, on some issues where we could have made a lot more progress, I think, to serve everybody in our country if some of the Democrats who voted against things were, were just willing to, you know, take a tough vote. And I also know that that's easier said than done, having been in politics, but you need it. Do you expect the Hispanic voters to continue to support the GOP? Uh, it's a great question. I just saw an NBC News poll today that had Biden's approval rating with Hispanic voters at 40%. Uh, and with black voters at 68%. I mean, that's low, uh, and so is 40%. I, you know, there is no question that in especially some parts of the country, like, like South Florida among Venezuelan Americans and Cuban Americans, and South Texas among Mexican Americans, that Republicans garnered more support than they did in 2016. At the same time, I haven't sensed this mass movement of people away from the Democratic Party. I think that you take candidates, for instance, like Beto O'Rourke. I think he's going to do pretty well among Hispanic voters in Texas. Um, or Mark Kelly in Arizona. You don't, one of the things that's not written about in the Hispanic community is the story of how in places like Nevada, in New Mexico, in Arizona, 
And 20 years ago in California, it was really the Hispanic vote that helped turn it around, not the only reason, of course, but really turned it toward Democrats. And it's still voting in high 50s or low 60s for Democrats. I mean, that's a big, important part of the coalition. So it's possible that there might be like some loss of support in 2020 or 2022 based on the numbers that we're seeing, but I don't think that it's going to be massive. We'll have to see. We have time for just a couple of more questions. Mm -hmm. um, if President Biden decides not to run in 2024, who do you envision would be a good pick for the Democratic Party? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, let me say that if Biden decides to run, of course, the nomination is his for the taking. And uh, at the same time, I don't believe that he's going to run for re-election. And the reason that I don't believe that is that he has said pretty consistently through the years that he wanted to be this sort of transition, you know, and I think especially with the string of successes that he's had, that sets that up for that. Okay, you were there for one term and had all these victories and, and then handed it off. Who knows? I think if he doesn't run, that it's going to be a wide open race. And uh, I would expect, of course, Vice President Harris would be probably the leading candidate, as vice presidents usually are. Um, but there are a number of other people, you know, from governors to... Uh, Secretary Buttigieg to any number of people that I think could run. Which leads me to my final question. <laughs> Do you continue to have higher political aspirations? Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'll jump into it again at some point. I just don't know when that'll be. Um, you know what's weird is that because I lost my first mayor's race when I was 30 years old, I ran in 2005 for mayor of San Antonio and I lost in a close runoff and waited four years and came back and then uh, I was out of it during after the Obama administration for those years, and of course I'm out of it now. I don't miss it. <laughs> like I, I, I like governing. I like feeling like you're doing something that can help people, and I don't think that helping like help is a four-letter word. You know, during the Reagan administration, they, they could help people like that's a four-letter word. No, I mean, you know, Chuck Schumer the other day said the difference between he and Mitch McConnell was that he wanted to help people in their lives. Like, yeah, that's what I believe in. And I like governing, but I don't necessarily miss all of the other stuff that goes, goes with it, you know. The, um, you have to develop very thick skin these days in this day and age of social media and polarization and everything else. So I'll jump into it at some point. Uh, I don't know that it would be 2024. I wouldn't completely rule it out, but that's definitely, I'm not, if you're gonna do something like that, you got to be preparing for it, and I'm not right now. <laughs> so. so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> saying there's a chance. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All I can think of right now is when Michael Jordan retired in 1999. He said he was 99.9% .9 retired two years later. That's right. <laughs> Came back to the Wizards, right? Julian Castro, thank you so much for coming to Pittsfield. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before we conclude, I just want to uh, acknowledge a, a number of people. Um, I wanted to acknowledge our dignitaries that are present in the audience tonight. Uh, as we saw before, Pittsfield Mayor Linda Tyre is here. As w Please. Pittsfield City Council President Peter Marchetti. Pittsfield Superintendent of Schools, Joseph Curtis. State Representative, Tricia Farley-Bouvier. And District Attorney, Andrea Harrington. I want to thank the many people of Temple on Shea-Munim who make this lecture uh, so smooth on a yearly basis. I want to thank our facilities manager, Dave Wallace, who I actually see outside right now preparing our own egg. Um, Dave does everything uh, for our building, uh, from technology to cleaning to getting people online. It, it's wonderful what he does. I want to thank our office manager, Lisa Pincus Hamroff. She may be wandering around somewhere as well. Lisa handles all of the nitty-gritty tasks that come on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we're organized. I want to thank Rabbi Liz, as always, for her leadership for this lecture committee. Uh, I want to thank 
the entire lecture committee. Uh, every, this is a year-round project that we, we begin tomorrow as we start to think about who we're going to have in 2023. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Andy Hotchberg. Andy led this lecture for over 20 years, and Andy, for, for everything with the temple and the lecture, has, has always been so invaluable to me. So, Andy, thank you. I invite everybody outside to the portico, just out, uh, as you go outside for a little bit of food and nosh, and you can meet Mr. Castro. Um, while you go outside, our uh, social action co-chairs, Larry and Janie Pellish, also have a table as they're collecting coins for fuel that will assist the Pittsfield Area Council of Cong Congregations Fuel Assistance Program. Um, that is very important, especially during the winter months. The last two people I want to thank, as I always do at the end of our lecture, I want to thank, as we're thinking of tonight, Drs. Armand and Donald Fiegenbaum, uh, who we are once again uh, doing our best to honor their, their wishes and the, the spirit of their mother, Hilda Allen Fiegenbaum. So we're thinking of Armand and Donald very much tonight, and we know their presence is here. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you next year.